John Miller was born in 1958 in Ithaca, New York. His dad, Jimmy Miller, was the Cornell University wrestling coach and small town pastor. This is probably why John finds it so natural to coach and teach. At 18, he asked 16-year-old Karen to a movie, and a few short years later, they married in June 1980. Hired by Cargill off the Cornell University campus to be a grain trader, John and Karen lived in three states in five years, finally settling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In early 1986, John began a new career providing leadership and sales management training to Twin Cities corporations from all industries. And when John created QBQ, the question behind the question. Throughout a decade of selling and facilitating training for executives and managers, he discovered the incredible need for personal accountability. In 1995, he chose to become a keynote speaker, titling his sessions Personal Accountability and the QBQ, even though some people told him that personal accountability isn't a topic. John's speaking career took off and he began writing books, gaining the new title of author. As physicians, we are problem solvers by nature, but sometimes, especially when it doesn't apply to patient care, we might not be asking the right questions as managers. So he helps us reframe our questions to help us be better managers, bosses, and team leaders. This is all about personal accountability. So if this isn't your speed, switch back to the Tim Ferriss podcast. We talk about personal accountability when it comes to managing our staff, managing our patients, and working in large institutions that don't love you back. He can be found at qbq.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Have you ever considered a different way of practicing medicine? I have. Whether you're burned out, need a change of pace, or are looking to supplement your income, locum tenens might be the solution for you. Not sure where to start? Locum Story is the place where you get real, unbiased answers to your questions. They answer basic questions like, what is locum tenens? To more complex questions about pay ranges, taxes, different specialties, and how locum tenens can work for you. Go to locumstory.com or drpodcastnetwork.com slash locumstory to get the answers. John Miller, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brad. Great to be here. So everyone can find you on qbq.com because that is your thing. You're the question behind the question guy, right? So yep. what do you mean by that? For the audience members that haven't read your book sure. yet, what is the question behind the question? I do the word yet. <laughs> they haven't read the book yet. Yes. Uh, QBQ is a book. It's an easy read. takes about an hour. It's lighthearted yet very meaningful because it hits a principle that some people think is disappearing rapidly in our society, Brad, and that is personal accountability. Let me give you a little background here. I came out of Cornell University, Ithaca, New York, 1980. My wife and I left town. She was 19. We had just married. I was 22. And I spent you know, five years working at a desk, eight to five, didn't really enjoy it. And one day, a friend said to me, why don't you get into sales? And I didn't know I had that personality. And I said, oh, no, I could never sell. And he said, no, I think you should try it. So I started interviewing. And in early 86, I left the big company and started selling management training. And that's a very key point to my story, because then I'm representing another person who would created training materials. And all of a sudden, I'm calling on executives, middle managers, HR people, training people in hospitals, but in pharmaceutical firms and in medical device companies, but then in industrial organizations that made widgets. And I'm learning a ton by running workshops with my mentor's material, but I'm sitting with real managers day in, day out, listening to them. And one day, it dawned on me after several years, people ask really lousy questions externally focused question, including me. So for 10 years, I sold this training. It was in Minneapolis, St. Paul. That's where we lived. And I started recognizing, Brad, people were saying, why do we have to go through all this change? When is someone going to train me? When will that department do its job right? And one day, 
I took a few minutes and I told the group, I said, let's turn those questions around. Let's call them the question behind the question. So instead of asking, why do we have to go through all this change? Let's ask, what can I do to adapt to the changing world? Well, I taught this for about 20 minutes and I came back to an organization called St. Jude Medical. They, they make heart valves. One of the wealthiest companies, six, most successful firms in America. It wasn't like I was dealing with startup firms that didn't have any track record or firms that were about to fail. These were very successful companies. And in a meeting, the VP of operations at St. Jude Medical turned to his HR VP and said, wait a minute, we need to ask the question behind the question. Well, this was a couple months after I taught the idea to his group. And I remember thinking, wow, they remembered it. It stuck with them. And Brad, if you much about the training industry, about 98% of the stuff that's out there does not stick with people. So that was mid nineties, 1995, when he turned to his HR VP and said, we need to ask the question behind the question. So I started teaching it to all my groups. It was quickly shortened to QBQ because we all love acronyms. And all of a sudden I was off and running on a new career, running around this great country, talking about personal accountability and giving people QBQ as the tool. Surgeons, doctors need tools, right? We all need a good tool. This tool, QBQ, was allowing people to practice personal responsibility, personal accountability. That's just the beginning of the story. So you mentioned that people ask lousy questions. So what are some common threads, some common themes in these lousy questions? Yeah, sure. Well, okay, let's look at three traps that humans face. And by the way, for your audience, we had none of this planned. I told you, just ask me questions and I'm going to run with it. But there are three traps that QBQ addresses. And that's important to know because people might, why is this QBQ valuable? Why have you been teaching it for 25 plus years? There's three human traps we all fall into. One is victim thinking or entitlement would be its twin, entitlement thinking, I deserve. The second one is blame or finger pointing. And the third one is procrastination, delaying action. So victim thinking, blame, and procrastination. So what I learned is when I heard people say, oftentimes whispering to me in the hallway during a training session, we take a break, why doesn't our CEO give us the vision? And somebody would say, why am I not paid more? And maybe in your business as doctors, why don't the patients listen to me more? I started to realize, well, that's kind of victim thinking. And of course, why is this happening to me is a question John Miller has asked. So the theme of the why questions was victim thinking. That's a problem. Then there was a theme that kind of developed with the who question. So if you think about this for a minute, who dropped the ball and who missed the deadline and who made the mistake and whose dumb idea was this and, and who created this schedule? Well, that's just blame because we're looking for a culprit. We're seeking culprits, bad stuff. And then when questions would take us to procrastination. When will they get back to me? When will I get better patients? <laughs> when will I get better customers? When will my boss coach me more? Well, that's just procrastination because the minute I ask, when will someone else take action? I am not taking action. So quick summary. Why questions lead me to victim thinking and the who questions lead me to blame, who done it, and when questions take me to procrastination. So then how do we formulate a good question. How do we get to a QBQ? It's funny. It took me about a year to develop the formula for QBQ. I was out teaching the idea of personal accountability and I was covering QBQ, but it wasn't until I'd held a couple of training sessions with this message where I was able to really crystallize in my mind. My mentor used to say, what you're teaching, whatever you're teaching, if it doesn't explode first in your mind, you cannot teach it. It's got to explode in your mind. Then you can teach it. And one day I just realized that every time I asked the better question, which we call the QBQ, the question behind the question, it would begin with what or how, not why or when or who. So instead of asking, why don't I get more training? What about asking, what can I do today to develop myself? So by turning the question around and beginning it with what or how, it put me into a stance where I was going to do something valuable and not just have a pity party. The second guideline was, we realized that every QBQ I ever threw out to an audience had the word I in it, the personal pronoun I. And we can come back to the reason for that in a minute. But it didn't have we in it or they or you. It had I in it, making it personal accountability oriented. And then thirdly, we discovered as I was teaching it that all QBQs tend to drive people toward positive action. 
getting stuff done, getting off the couch, stop feeling sorry for myself and go do something. So the third guideline became focuses on action. So in creating a QBQ, and as you mentioned up front, all of this is on QBQ.com. It begins with water how, it contains the word I, and it focuses on action. So instead of asking, when is that department going to do its job right? I could be asking, how can I today be my best? What can I do today to serve that department? So that's what QBQs look and sound like. So let's take that formula and then apply it to different situations that physicians see. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the fact that as physicians, we're managers in two different respects. We manage our patients and we manage our staff and our training, but those are two different relationships. But before we get to that, I want to talk about what you mentioned was victim thinking. And there's a lot of that happens working in a large institution and working in medicine in general. Like I have to jump through a ton of hoops every year. I've got to do fire safety training at three different hospitals, even though it's the same proprietary course, it doesn't right. count. So it's just a huge time suck and it sucks. And that's just one example of like many things that we have to do. Just Tell to us how you really feel. A lot of people, they work in say a large institution and it's not something that loves you back. You pour your heart into your work. You pour your heart into your patients. You do everything you're supposed to do. You might do research. You might work on committees, but the institution itself, it really doesn't love you back. So you might end up thinking, right? That victim thinking, like this place just, it's oppressive. It's, I'm not being recognized. I'm not being appreciated. I'm being overlooked. All my hard work, nobody's seeing it. So how do you practice person accountability without that quid pro quo type of thinking? Like my chairman doesn't recognize me. I didn't get promoted from assistant to associate or associate. I'm not in academia. I don't don't even know which one's higher, but so I'm not getting what I think I deserve for doing all this hard work, Mm -hmm. but we know we should be doing this hard work. What's the QBQ in that? Yeah, there's so many directions we could go right now with that question, Brad. And by the way, just so your audience knows, I have no background in healthcare. I do know what a DRG is, though. Do you? Sounds familiar. We'll get into it some other time. Yeah. That was back in the 80s. My wife's a registered nurse, so I understand some stuff about the healthcare world. I met with a doctor two days ago and asked her questions about her culture in the organization because I have a tendon problem and I got a shot, steroids to fix the trigger thumb. Trigger finger, yeah. Yep. So I'm a consumer of healthcare. My wife's an RN. I have a feeling for the industry. I was glad to hear you say, as doctors, we learn about the medical stuff, but we don't get trained to to manage people. And I know what you're thinking, Brad, you're thinking that's unique to healthcare. But let me tell you one more time, my background, 10 years of selling management training. One thing I discovered is the biggest weakness in an organization is the whole people management skills thing, because most people are actually promoted to manager for the wrong reason. So they're never really trained to manage people. So it's not just in a hospital. It's not just with doctors. But what about all that management training you were selling? Wasn't that going to fix the problem? Well, right. That was with only the companies that would buy from me. (laughs) You're still selling it. You're still selling. But seriously, even today now, we, we have seven kids. Karen and I have seven kids and their ages are 38 down to 22 And the 38-year-old works with me at QBQ Inc. She goes around the country speaking on personal accountability 13 years now. I hired her when she was 25. That's a whole other story, but a lot of fun. But our younger kids, we've even watched them go out and get jobs at Kroger stores, the Starbucks, whatever. And oh my gosh, the need for people management training is everywhere. But that's not our topic here. I understand that. So when I heard you say some of those things, you know, the, the organization doesn't love me back and whatever. My first thought is always this, going back to the reality that, you ready? It's profound. I chose the profession. End of story. Sometimes principals have brought me in because they hear from their teachers in public ed usually. I'm overworked and underpaid. And sometimes the principal, I think, wants me, the outsider, to to just say, but you chose the profession. I have two son-in-laws who are pastors. So they're working in faith-based institutions. Brad, you're never going to get rich being a pastor. I don't know. Joel Osteen, he seems to do pretty well. Joel Osteen, yeah, that's a whole other story too. (laughs) You know, I mean, my son-in-laws don't complain about their income, but if a pastor was ever to complain about their income, the answer is the same, but you chose the profession. Okay, doc, you chose the profession, 
of representing and working in and out of three different hospitals and patients who are not always going to listen to your advice and all that stuff. So what are you going to do about recognizing choices? You made the choice. Okay. The minute I maturely say I made the choice, I chose this job. Then I can start relaxing a little bit and saying, okay, my frustration is going away because I put myself here and now ask a QBQ, what can I do to be my best today? And, and how can I serve my individual patients? And what can I do to speak to the administrator about some problems I'm seeing in the organization? Instead of going home and talking to my spouse about it, what can I do at this moment to take personal accountability and own the problem as opposed to whining, complaining, blaming. Now, don't get me wrong, please, you and your listeners and viewers, please understand John Miller whines. If my wife was in here, she'd tell you I wear a sign around my neck that says John Miller chief whiner. <laughs> you know, that's how QBQ works. It makes me stop and think. And I go, okay, I'm whining. That, that doesn't get me anywhere. What can I do right now to move forward? And then, of course, we could always get into the ultimate QBQ because it really applies in so many of the situations you mentioned. It took me a couple of years to figure this one out, but the ultimate QBQ, and it came from a session where somebody said, what if I ask all these great questions and they don't work? And I said, there's one more. How can I let go of what I can't control? Boom. How can I let go of what I can't control? Now, Brad, I know you're an MD. If you have any psychology in your background, but emotionally strong, mature people do have the ability to let go of stuff they can't control. And that usually involves systems that are bigger than they are and people, because I can't change people. I would suggest that any doctor or any employee or any person ever in the, anywhere in the world who's frustrated, disappointed, hurt, what can I do to be forthright and communicate with my administrator? How can I let go of what I can't control? What can I do today to move forward? How can I focus on me and being my best and learning new skills? You know, oh, gee, I got to do, what did you say about the fire, fire thing? safety training? At okay, well, hospitals. gee, yeah. you chose to work in a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a speaker. I've flown millions of miles. It's a wonderful career. Brad, I've been all over the world speaking since 1995. I shouldn't complain about flying, should I? Because I chose this profession. Yeah. With my wife's permission, by the way. That being said, things evolve. Professions oh, yeah. evolve. And, you know, what the state of medicine, well, that's some of the, co the complaints that we hear are from the more senior physicians. They're used to medicine being what it was 20, 30 years ago. And so as things change, the electronic medical record that was, hasn't oh, yeah. been a thing, right? All these regulations, the government requires us to collect certain information that makes the, you know, is onerous for the patients and, and for the staff and the physicians. So the, the things about, this wasn't what I signed up for when I signed up, it's moved in this direction. I guess you can do what everybody does when they're unhappy with their career, go into real estate. Yeah. <laughs> everybody goes into real estate. It is remarkable that you said that because that is a humongous trend among physicians. There are a bunch of doctors who then sell courses on real estate. Like they, they're, and who do they sell to? They sell to other physicians. Why? Of because they human do. beings are tribal That's all they know. and we trust other yeah. physicians more right, than we right, trust right. just some random real estate salesman. So that's like how a lot of physicians have pivoted and it's just, it's remarkable that you use that as an example because it's something happening in medicine. My dad was Cornell wrestling coach for 25 years, but he was also a pastor like my son-in-laws. So I'm very connected with pastors in this Denver community. And I've seen a lot of them leave the church and go into real estate. <laughs> it just happens. But the, the premise here is personal accountability and I can't change others and I can't change systems that are bigger than I am. So what can I do? What can I do today to be my best? What can I do today to contribute to the world? What can I do today to help a patient? What can I do today to become a better communicator? One of the lousy questions we hear often is, why don't they communicate better? And that came out of my sessions. For years, I would say, I'd get a flip chart out, Brad, 12 people in a room, managers. I'd say, what's your biggest problem around here? And the C word would come up, not competition, not confusion, and not even change. Communication. And it was always framed with, why don't they communicate better? The mature leader, the accountable person, 
asks, what can I do to be a better understander of people? How can I better understand those around me? What can I do to ask better questions? How can I not make assumptions, but clarify first? What can I do to be a better communicator? So all QBQ is, is it is a tool to help me bring everything back to me, not in a burdensome way, not in a shaming way. I'm not a bad person because I made a mistake, but I'm an accountable person if I say, what can I do to learn from it? I'm not a bad person because I've been blaming, but I'm an accountable person who learns it's better to ask, well, what can I do to help solve the problem? Versus who did this? Accountability. There you go, Brad. I just happened to have the book <laughs> handy. QBQ, okay? <laughs> Good stuff. So what about with regards to patient care? It, it seems simple enough to apply that to staff, simple to conceptualize, inordinately complicated to apply. But when you're, you can't, the staff isn't doing this, the staff isn't, right, ultimately it's what can I do to get them to do this or what can I do to frame it differently or make it a more comfortable environment or something? Like, how can I change so that this is no longer an issue? But when it comes to patient care, I, I think it's a little different, right? How do we frame that when you know, patients won't take their medications, won't follow up as planned, don't show up on time, don't show up at all for appointments, don't stick to their lifestyle. As a physician, I'm going to tell my patient that they need to move more and eat less. And they come right. back the next visit and that hasn't happened. They've gained five pounds. Yes. Clearly it's their fault, right? For not following my recommendations. That's not really the case because we know this is how human beings work. That's right. not a reasonable thing to ask of someone without having some type of plan to execute it. And one thing that we know is we don't know what the right answer to that is yet. So <laughs> if we knew the right answer, then people would be able to lose weight, but it doesn't happen because as physicians and healthcare says, we don't have the answers to that yet. Hopefully someone figures that out. We're the accountable ones for the care of our patients. What is the correct question to ask myself? Yeah, sure. A lot of stuff there again. When you have a couple of things, Zig Ziglar is probably the most famous motivational speaker ever. He passed away a few years ago. He's from Texas. Some of your listeners might know that name, Zig Ziglar, but he had a great line. I remember listening to his audio tapes in the 90s. He, For 25 years, I was 25 pounds overweight by choice. And then he'd say, you wonder why I say by choice? Because I never accidentally ate anything. <laughs> That's exactly right. I, John Miller was overweight. Get this. In high school, I wrestled 132 pounds as a senior, 1976. By 2012, I was weighing like 195. I'm only five foot six, but all that traveling, sitting on airplanes, eating peanut, going to hotel rooms and getting room service. And oh, gee, that bread pudding just showed up on my plate up magically. How did that happen? Oh, I must have ordered it. So starting in 2012, I started on a program that I could never sell because it was too simple. I started walking three miles a day and I cut back on what I'm eating and I lost 43 pounds. So it can be done. But for John Miller to blame my doctor, the healthcare industry, or the food industry, or the airline industry for my being overweight, I had to accept that personal accountability to take action and get it done. Here's my question to docs. What's causing you to fear telling patients the truth? I don't understand. I have had one doctor in all the years I was overweight suggest very mildly and meekly, I might want to lose a few pounds. Do doctors fear being blunt with their patients? I don't know. It's just a rhetorical question. Because that's not the issue. Because if you're blunt with the patient and say something like you're fat, Right. That's not going to establish a trusting relationship between yes, you and the patient. You've burned that bridge and that patient. So there you go. When do I learn to be adroit? When do I learn to be smooth? When do I learn to do, deliver the right message to a patient without offending them? That's an accountability. But thing. here's the issue. What we're talking about accountability. I'm accountable for the care of my patients. That we're not turning this around into, I'm gonna tell my patients that they're accountable for this. They are, because they have to live with the consequences. We'll use overweight as an example. They have to live with the consequences of being overweight. And there are a lot of societal issues that play into that. Ultimately, it is their responsibility, but it's also my responsibility as a caretaker. So we're not talking here about just telling our patients that it's this is your responsibility, this is on you, right? What we're talking about is the perspective of the caregiver, because ultimately 
as physicians. And I hear this, like Bill Maher said this, oh, I've never had a doctor tell me that I needed to lose weight. We talk to the patients about this all the time. We mention it, we mention it in different ways. The, the problem is if society is getting bigger and bigger, that tells me it's not necessarily a personal accountability issue alone. There's so much that's at play here. They need us to be partners, not to just say, this is your responsibility. Good luck, right? It is, I am responsible for their care. They're my patient. So what's the QBQ? You're accountable as a doc. You're only accountable for your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. There's nothing else you can change. So you can alter thinking, you can alter feelings, and you can alter behaviors. Now, when we're talking about asking these questions, we're really talking about thoughts. That's the power of QBQ, is it is a thought-shaping tool. So instead of asking, why won't my patients listen to me, which is victim thinking, then we got to put the what and how in there and the I, focus on action. How can I become a better communicator? Instead of asking, why won't patients do what I tell them to do? There's a QBQ, what can I do to impress upon them the importance of follow through on what I recommend? Here is a very key point. And it's funny, I'm not a doc, but boy, do we have the same situation in my business. We sell training, Brad. We license a training program. We ship it to a customer in Topeka, Kansas. By phone and email, Kristen, my daughter and I can coach. We can recommend. We can make suggestions. We can be blunt. But if the client doesn't take the training program off the shelf and implement it, they better not be complaining to us a year later, it didn't work. <laughs> so we deal with this all the time because we can't make the patient exercise. We can't make the patient eat better. We can't make the patient take his meds. We can't make our patients, which are corporations, use the training they bought from us. They'll spend thousands of dollars, sometimes some customers, and then never use the training because priorities change. Okay, what does that mean to me as the doctor? Well, I got to let go of it. I can't do a thing about it. Hey, I sent the emails. I made the suggestions. I gave you the ideas. I phoned you. I, I followed up. Kristen followed up. You still didn't use the training program. I don't know where else to go with that other than to ask the ultimate QBQ. How can I let go of what I can't control? Although it seems to me your point before about taking action, right? One way of taking action would be to read up more on behavioral science, right? What are effective methods that I can use to communicate to my patients or that they can use to, to change so that I can help them be better equipped to help, help themselves. Because in, in medicine, we don't really learn that. We learn that they need to eat less and move more. But right. what we don't learn are effective methods for making that happen. And mm -hmm. so I think to your point earlier, taking action, what can I do? What can I do to give better advice? What can I do to be an effective community? What can I earn to all that stuff, their trust. So I think that integrating that and then, yeah, and then letting go, but oh, man, that's hard. Ethical quandary there. See, you use the key word and I'm not in any way picking on you because you, th you threw one word into a sentence because we're flying fast here, but making, I can't make anybody do anything. And that's something we teach managers. Okay. You might be able to fire. Facilitate. Okay. Fine. Fine. But you, you can't make someone do anything. And that's where we get frustrated. But back to my analogy with corporations, we sell them medicine, we sell them QBQ training. And if they happen to put it on the shelf and their HR person leaves and their trainer quits and the VP who bought the program gets hit by a bus, heaven forbid, and the program's sitting on the shelf, well, all I can do is try to re-educate the next set of customers over there. And if they don't want to use it because they didn't buy it, I can't change that. So emotionally, here's, this, here's the key. As, a, as an emotionally healthy person, I need to let go of that at some point when I've tried everything I can think of to get the client to take their meds. I understand what you're saying about the doctors. The guy back in 07 said, John, I think you should lose a few pounds. I ignored it for five years, but he couldn't come to my house and put me on my treadmill. Yeah, but sometimes <laughs> we're compensated or maybe we will be based on how well our patients do, right? As you're like hemoglobin A1C, right? That's a long-term measure of how well your blood sugar is being controlled. So the lower my patient's hemoglobin A1C is, the more I might be compensated. So again, I can't make them do it, but what are ways that I can better facilitate that happening? You're right on target. It comes down to me improving my skills in influencing others, communicating to others, asking better questions of others, building a trusting relationship. Trust me, I understand that trusting relationship 
that part. The other day when I went in for this trigger thumb to get a shot, quite honestly, the MD spent 45 minutes chatting with me. And her first question was, what do you do for a living, John? And what are your hobbies? And it didn't come off like a canned question, like a bank teller. Bank teller will say, is today your day off? And it always sounds like a canned question. But this doc, she's 55 years old, been doing this 30 years, and she just had a marvelous ability to draw me in, build trust. We had a wonderful time while she put pain into my thumb. (laughs) Her name's Julie. I think, okay, Dr. Julie, how could you take those skills and share them with other docs? Because you were wonderful. Yeah. Sometimes they know, and sometimes it's innate. Sometimes things like that, it's just you're born with it. So the QBQ is something that I stole from you without realizing do that. It. Yeah, because I refer to the QBQ in a different situation. And I'm hoping maybe this might not apply and it might. So let's give it a try. When people come to a doctor's appointment, there's sometimes the question that they ask, but sometimes there's this undercurrent of another question that they might not verbalize. So that's what I refer to the question behind the question. So like, as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, people come in all the time with something that we call globus. It's just a feeling like there's a lump in your throat. Doc, why do I feel Hard this? Why do I maybe. throat clear? <clears throat> there's all this mucus. It feels like yeah. there's something down there. And so there's really two questions there. One is, or three, I guess. One is what's going on? What's causing this? Two, how can I make it go away? And three is the question that they don't ask. Do I have throat cancer? So unless they leave that visit, and I have said, oh, and by the way, you don't have throat cancer. They're going to be thinking, did he check for this? Did he evaluate for this? Could I still have that? So even though the lump sensation we might be getting to fixing it, they're still leaving with this anxiety. So how do I elicit from them the QBQ? What is their QBQ is? Let's go back to why I just mentioned to Dr. Julie. How did she get information, thoughts, feelings, and emotions, whatever, out of me? Why did we have such a wonderful time together? Very quickly, built a trusting relationship. Why? It all began with the questions she asked. I am amazed in the customer service world today with all our knowledge about customer service that you can still find a server at a restaurant who is cold to you or a banker who doesn't speak to you properly, whatever. I walk away from that. Bear with me on this. After 35 years in this business and think, how can people still be rude to the customer when we all know how competitive the world is. Go back to a doctor. We all have personalities. Some are introverts, some are extroverts, some are friendly, some are naturally cold. Okay, the question is, what can I do to build a relationship with my patients? So if I'm not a naturally warm and friendly person, if I'm not Dr. Julie, if I don't have those good questions to ask, what can I do to learn? How can I change me? It always, everything comes back to me. I, we didn't plan any of this, but I was just thinking, For years, I would sit executives down at a coffee table or a conference room table, and I'm selling training. What do you think my goal was, Brad? To get them to open up. If they didn't share real problems, I couldn't help them. So here, at first, they might say, we have a productivity problem. Okay, 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, an hour later, finally, the executive admits, I got three guys who are just plain lazy. So I finally got to his emotional frustration. He has three people on the team who don't really want to be there. That's a whole different problem. So it does come down to that questioning, that demeanor, that style, that personality. And I think personally, like we've got one daughter who's an introvert, but as an athletic trainer at a high school, she's had to learn to be extroverted. These skills can be learned. So what can we do to establish the trust quickly, because these doctors visit short, so that the patient feels comfortable verbalizing it. Sounds like a good question to me. What can I do to learn to build relationships quickly with my customers? Dr. Julie, who I just met with, she should be out teaching this stuff because I am a student of people. That's where I get all my stories. So I'm watching her the other day, sitting across a little table, holding onto my thumb and feeling for pain, asking questions, we ended up talking about topics I've never discussed with a doctor. I don't mean personal stuff. I mean, just like one of my hobbies is reptiles. No joke. I've always (laughs) had some reptiles. Ever since I was seven years old, my dad bought me a boa constrictor. Don't think I'm weird. There's a lot of reptile enthusiasts. Guess what she tells me? We had a snake in our basement yesterday. So she tells me the whole story. We had a great time together. Now, it's her job to manage her time. It's not my job to manage her time. But I walked away feeling very positive about the 45 minutes we spent together. And it all came down to the question she asked me. Yeah. 
Amazing. Amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to the physician audience about this. So we can find you at qbq.com. There's the original book, right? Do you mind if I show them? We have QBQ. QBQ. And the sequel, Flipping the Switch. Got to have that one. Then we came out with a workbook for QBQ if you want to go deeper. Then we have a parenting book, Raising Accountable Kids. How important is that in today's world? And then this one is outstanding, 47 Ideas for Your Organization. People say, John, why don't you write another book? And I say, I've got five I'm selling. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sell these five, Brad, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they can all be found at qbq.com, right? Yeah, all at qbq.com. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much for your time. Sure. Thank you for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Such a great show with John Miller. But before we finish up, don't forget to visit locumstory.com or drpodcastnetwork.com slash locumstory to get real, unbiased answers to all your locum tenants' questions. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.